But until silver is once again reintroduced as the people's money, then the command economy will gain prominence and the most basic of liberties will be in danger. Well, hello there, my friends. Rafi here from the Endgame Investor with this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics. And we're headed into the rough part of the Endgame, I think. And I don't mean the spot price of silver, though right now that is part of it. I'm talking about the command economy is starting to show its ugly face. And I'll show you three examples of where that's coming from. And one of those sources includes a website that we all love, Zero Hedge. But what I want to focus on today is the registered silver supply, which is broken below 50 million ounces, but not just at the COMEX, also at the LBMA. We're seeing record low silver supplies of about 900 million ounces now, a fall of 34.4 million ounces since July. Silver physical premiums remain at record highs, but also... We've got gold Krugerrand premiums at all-time record highs, so the premium issue is spreading to other precious metals. We have a platinum drain ongoing at the COMEX as well, and there have been rumors of a premium in Shanghai, and maybe the gold that is being drained from the COMEX is heading to China, but I've done some research on that, and I have a surprising answer. The premiums are not in China. They are in a different country, one that is slightly less scary, I think. And then finally... We're going to go into the command economy and what is going on in Europe. That winter is coming. It is going to be brutal and many people are going to freeze. But what does the command economy have to do with gold and silver? Simple. The only reason that governments would push for a command economy where the government demands a certain production per quota per month Soviet style is because the money no longer works to divide goods and services. And when they keep you, force you to use that money, meaning the dollar or the euro, whatever currency it is that doesn't work, then you have to start imposing quotas with penalties like imprisonment or death or whatever it might be. That is coming. How far it will go, I don't know. But until silver is once again reintroduced as the people's money, then the command economy will gain prominence and the most basic of liberties will be in danger. Anyway, let's get going with this week's Silver Report. This Silver Report is brought to you by Fortuna Silver Mines, symbol FSM. I wanted to get a little bit into one of its mines in San Jose, Mexico, its main mine, just to get an idea of the production economics here. First half, 2022, silver and gold production of 2,743,526 ounces, that's silver, and 16,534 ounces of gold with an all-in sustaining cost for silver of $15.36. So $15.36 AISC of silver production. That is still about 25% below where we are now, um, maybe 20% below, meaning they are still profitable at these very low silver prices. And it would take sustained silver prices of way below $15 for a year or two to make a dent in this company in a fundamental way. So the point is, Fortuna is, is comfortably profitable, even at these prices, and they will continue to be. We'll begin at the COMEX with an update of registered silver supplies. Surprise, surprise, they keep falling. They've fallen another three point something million ounces since September. You can see the little bumps down here. I drew a black line over here at the beginning of June about 80 million ounces. So 80 million ounces now to 47.5 million ounces. That is a rate of about 10 million ounces per month. So in about five months, we will have zero registered silver at the COMEX. As long as price stays low as it is now, this fall will continue and it will intensify. Let's go to the next exchange, the LBMA. This chart was shown to me by some guy named Chris Marcus who got to it before me on Twitter. I usually beat him, but this time he got me. <laughs> okay, so silver inventories fall under 34.4 million ounces at LBMA, a new record low since counting had begun in 2016. There probably was some counting before that, but good luck finding a chart or a one. I don't know how to find it. 
We have 916,497,000 ounces of silver, and silver does not go to central banks. This silver is going to stackers, to wealthy stackers, maybe to some industry, and to retail bullion coin market. Exactly where it's going, we do not know, but I will show you some hints. Next chart. I've shown you the silver premium, the junk silver premiums every week for the past month, I think. They're still at around 40% all-time record highs, but now the premium market is bleeding into gold as well. You see here this vertical line from about 5.4 to now 6.2, 6.3, something like that. The premiums all over the gold market jumped about between 0.7, 0.8% overnight. I'm not sure exactly what happened. Maybe it's a glitch. I don't think so. But we'll see what happens in the next few weeks, whether these premiums sustain themselves or, or maybe there's some news in the physical gold market. But in any case, the physical markets are starting to break through. Just starting now, we have a 6.3% premium, 6.2% premium on gold Krugerrands, and they've spiked up for all other gold coins as well. This, I think, is important to address. There have been some rumors online about a Shanghai gold premium, premium for gold futures in Shanghai uh, over the New York COMEX contract, and that might be why gold is draining out of the COMEX. I did some little research on this. This is a chart from uh, Gold Charts or Us, and it goes up to July 15th. So I looked at the data from July 15th to now, uh, September 8th, and the premium has risen a little bit. It's just under 2% now. That is a little bit elevated, but it's nowhere near historic highs or anything like that. You can see here in 2013 and 2016, we spiked to about 3%, 3.5%, maybe just under 4% uh, all-time highs. I don't think 2% is enough to encourage a sustained move from New York to Shanghai and gold supplies. But you can see here that the discount on Shanghai gold uh, was extreme in 2020 which did lead to gold flowing from east to west, whether it was from Shanghai or from Switzerland. It seemed to have been from Switzerland. Maybe Switzerland and Shanghai worked together somehow in delivery contracts or something. I don't know. But it doesn't seem to be that there is any significant premium on Shanghai gold over New York. But I did find one that does have a premium, and that is India. If you look at the Indian gold market, can see here, you see the same discount for Indian gold um, over New York back in 2020 when gold started crazy flowing into the COMEX like never before. That is gone now. And now we have what looks to be a record premium of about 15.13%, as high as about 17% over here, and it's still very elevated. That means the Indians want their physical gold. This is a good sign. I'd much rather have the gold go to India than to China. The Indians have a lot less genocide under their belts, so you know that's always a good thing. And China, frankly, scares the crap out of me, but India, not so much. But back to Shanghai for a second. Gold Charts Us does have this nice little chart of silver stocks at the Shanghai Exchange. And we can see here that silver supplies topped out at about 5,200 tons, 5,300 tons or so in the middle of 2020. And here I drew a line where silver squeeze starts in February 2021, this red line. There was a peak here, a little tiny little peak in silver supplies from there. There's been a huge drain, a little bit of a bump, but we're going back down now. So it looks like silver squeeze has also impacted Shanghai. So silver squeeze is a global movement. It is not just people on Reddit. And it is also looks like it is affecting platinum, aka little silver. We can see here that platinum supplies have gone from about 700,000 ounces uh, right around silver squeeze here, February 2021 or so, and really fallen down fast to about 233,000 ounces, which is just under about half a million ounces of platinum, which is like most of it, I think like 60, 70% of the stuff. And we're almost back to pre-COVID lows here, pre-COVID levels. A few more weeks, maybe a few months should do it. And we'll see what happens in the platinum supply. I do not know where this stuff is going or if people are just buying it in lieu of gold or whatever. We'll see. Now, finally, there's three articles I wanted to share with you. One from Oil Price, one from FT, cited by Oil Price, and one, surprisingly, from Zero Hedge, all of which 
are advocating, pushing for a command economy where central banks dictate production quotas and not just setting monetary policy rates. If the end game is real, and I believe it is obviously, then the command economy is another step towards that because it means that the monetary medium no longer works and therefore central banks, rather than regulating the monetary medium, have to regulate actual production, which absolutely under no circumstances will work because that never works in history and it will not work this time. It will lead to mass starvation and that is coming. So have your stacks ready. You might need them for buying actual goods and services that you need to survive, especially if you're in Europe. A few weeks ago, maybe on my channel, maybe here, I'm not sure, I discussed this little paper about different types of central bank insolvency. And the first sentence of this abstract by a guy named Ricardo Ruiz, who was widely credited with inventing the concept of central bank insolvency, whatever that means. The first sentence says, a central bank is insolvent if its plans imply a Ponzi scheme on reserves, so the price level becomes infinity. That is academic speak, academic jargon for hyperinflation. So if its plans imply a Ponzi scheme on its reserves or a Ponzi scheme on its currency, basically. So you go back to this article, oilprice.com, Europe's reaction to the energy crisis is turning into a Ponzi scheme. That sounds like potential hyperinflation if you connect the dots here. I'll just read the first paragraph. The leadership of the European Union has been hard at work these days trying to find a lasting solution to an energy crisis that is worsening by the day. Yet the way they are approaching the solution is unlikely to produce any lasting results. And so far, it has been compared to a Ponzi scheme. One of the easiest policy levers, if you will, is that you can pass a bill, appropriate money, and give money to citizens to pay their electric bills. Well, that's more just theft than a Ponzi scheme. But former Energy Secretary Dan Brillera told CNBC this week, he went on to agree when asked whether the approach could be compared to a Ponzi scheme. And now, here's where we get into the command economy. This is quite scary, but expected. The Financial Times reported this week that the EU is seeking sweeping powers over businesses in member states that would basically allow Brussels to tell these companies what to produce, how much of it, and who to sell it to in times of a crisis. The definition of a crisis would be the prerogative of the same EU. So basically, we're talking about emergency powers dictated by the EU, granted to the EU by the EU for them to tell any company, any producer what to produce, how much of it, and who to sell it to and for how much. That is basically totalitarianism. And why is it necessary now? Because the money can no longer divide goods and services, as we see so obviously in Europe these days with the derivatives markets in the discussion to be halted. Why? Because they keep going up and up and up electricity derivatives. And that either leads to bailouts to maintain those positions, or if there are no bailouts, then those positions are forced to close, meaning forced closing of short positions leads to an, an enormous short squeeze that destroys the entire continent and electricity prices go to infinity and that infects the rest of the commodity markets. Just like we saw in nickel that day on March 7th, when nickel went near infinity and all other commodity markets were instantly affected, that would happen to other commodities if electricity derivatives are allowed to be forced to close and electricity companies are not bailed out. So either they print a massive amount of money, rumored to be about 1.5 trillion to bail these companies out, and keep the electricity derivatives markets going, or they don't bail them out and electricity prices go to infinity as these utilities providers are forced to close their positions and a short squeeze ensues. And so let's move to the FT. EU seeks sweeping powers over business for use in crises. Watch this quote. We would be very concerned if this proposal was adopted in such an interventionist shape, said Martinez Barisas, director for the internal market at Business Europe, which represents employers in the bloc. It could oblige member states to override contract law, force companies to disclose commercially sensitive information, and share their stockpiled products or dictate their production under any type of crisis the commission decides upon. In other words, the European Union is about to give itself theft powers over the entire stockpiles of all commodities in Europe because they just want to take it. And so this is definitely endgame material here. And the only way out of it 
is to reintroduce a fair and honest sound monetary system, which eventually will happen. The question is how much pain is Europe and the rest of the world going to have to endure until silver returns as money? And finally, it is not just our enemies like the FT and the EU that are considering a command economy of systemic and massive theft. It is also friendly websites like Zero Hedge. Zero Hedge, September 7th, 2022, 6.05 p.m. Central banks need to be targeting megawatt hours and tons of production, Soviet style, not inflation, by Michael Every of Rabobank. That source is quoted a lot on Zero Hedge. It is usually friendly, but this is completely insane. If we go to the final paragraph of this monstrosity of an article, the point, Michael Every says, is that one can start to construct a new mental framework where central banks actually need to be targeting megawatt hours and tons of production Soviet style as the key macro stability anchor. Get that right and get moderate inflation. Target just inflation, which you cannot control, and which governments are only pre pretending they can, and you won't end up with a macro stability or low inflation. Sadly, that might be the steeper learning curve for some. So basically he's saying central banks can't control inflation. They can only tell people how much of whatever to produce. But didn't we see communist systems lead to mass starvation when that was tried before Michael Every of Rabobank? What the hell is going on with people? The answer is you need to destroy the currency and return to sound money. That is the only answer to all of these problems. This is Rafi of the Endgame Investor coming at you with this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics. If you want to sign up to my YouTube channel, it's at Rafi Farber, link in the description below. Or you can sign up for a two-week free trial of the Endgame Investor where I talk about all this stuff all the time. Or you can become my patron on Patreon where I give a weekly biblical commentary on monetary policy, economics, and government. I'll see you guys next week.